our friends are the people we can talk to about, well, pretty much anything. What's frustrating or great about our jobs, our partner, our lecturer, about that new movie that's just come out, or the hike we did last weekend, the trip we're dreaming of taking, or how that silly scene from Friends makes us laugh so hard. But what would we do if a friend came to us and told us that they were struggling to get out of bed in the morning, or that they'd been up all night having panic attacks? Would you feel discomfort at this revelation? Because you'd be uncertain about how to respond or worried about saying the wrong thing. Or just a bit annoyed that they're throwing off your mojo when you'd rather talk about other things. Or what would you do if you were going through something yourself? Do you think you'd be okay to speak to someone about it? Or might you too feel worried? Worried about being a burden on someone? Or worried that if you said something, you'd be put in a box labeled crazy with your identity forever altered? These are some of the thoughts that I had when I was 14 years old and freshly diagnosed with OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I grew up in the bushland in the Adelaide Hills, the eldest of five girls, enjoying playing with my pets, doing well in school, and, you know, dreaming of becoming a vet or an author and saving the environment. In my perception back then, mental illness was for someone in a straitjacket in an asylum. Seeing a psychiatrist was for the irredeemably insane not for a 14-year-old girl, and certainly not for perfectionist me. And hence, in my worldview, this diagnosis was shattering. It was identity shattering. For not only was I living in this hell in my own head and struggling with the symptoms, but I had to live with the fear and uncertainty that people might treat me differently if they found out. To feel like I was put in this box with a crazy label on it. I thought I might never escape from it. I thought that all these other things that made me Emma were just lost in a world where psychiatrists focused solely on my symptoms. Going through this at a young age actually also made me realize a couple of things. It made me realize that you never know what someone's going through just by looking at them, to see past their odd behaviors, to know what's really happening inside. It made me realize how important it is for us to be gentle and accepting with each other. Because what got me through this was the support of a community. It was the community of people like my doctor, who I finally found, who saw all the other things that I am and helped me see a future and an identity beyond my illness, enough to work to recover and manage it. For those who don't know, OCD involves both obsessions, or these thoughts and ideas and worries that go round and round your head in an endless cycle, and compulsions, or the rituals and things you do to try and relieve some of the stress of these obsessions and prevent something bad happening, no matter how unlikely that might be. So for me, something simple like, say, touching a bus pole that was potentially, no matter how unlikely, contaminated with something, could potentially, no matter how unlikely, go on to get someone else sick. And hence, I had to prevent this at all costs, even if this meant crazy and over-the-top cleaning rituals. So how did I get through this? How do I stand here today without suffering from OCD anymore? It was the help of this community, the community of my family, who stuck by me even when it took hours of their coaxing and hard work to get through a simple morning routine and get me to school, who helped me find a doctor that would give me the treatment I needed, even when this was wreaking havoc with their lives too, and they didn't really understand my behavior. The community of the few friends who stuck by me, who treated me the same even when my behavior was odd at times. I can't tell you how grateful I am to those people who did something remarkable in the unremarkable by connecting and caring in a very normal way when I wasn't sure I'd still receive that from the world. This was all half my lifetime ago now, but I wouldn't have made it through without this care and support. But this wasn't guaranteed. In fact, the traditional mental health services I originally saw, I found that this was lacking. The psychiatrist I thought saw me just merely as a number. And it was hard for a lot of the people in my community to really be there for me in the way that I needed because of the lack of awareness and understanding about mental illness, because I never told anyone about my diagnosis or what I was going through internally because of the stigma attached. Hence, I could already see as a 14-year-old that we needed a radical shift in our mental health systems. There was a need for a radical shift in how we're given tools and support to connect to ourselves and each other. But I couldn't see back then how we could do this at a systems level, how we could put programs in place 
that enabled everyone to get the community of care that they needed. But the opposite of this fear is love. However, all these years later, despite some progress being made, we're still at a crisis point, with mental health systems strained around the world. This is especially true in low- and middle-income countries, where there's 90% of the need and only 10% of the resources available. By 2030, depression is set to be the leading cause of disease burden globally. One in four University UK undergrads will go through a mental illness. It's assumed that 45% of us will go through some mental health issue in our lifetime. And hence, through our relationships, all of us are affected. And so it might be odd that despite this ubiquity, many people still feel alone when they go through a struggle. And I believe this is because despite this ubiquity, there's still enormous discomfort for many of us to talk about or even think about mental illness. So what can we do? Research by the Pallix Foundation has found that many people still see mental illness as a character flaw, that sufferers just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get on with it. This is supported by the movies we watch as children, where an individual hero struggles to rise above their circumstances through their sheer willpower alone. I think sufferers of many chronic illnesses will recognize these comments and perceptions, but I believe sufferers of mental illness in particular, because it can be really hard for people to separate the person from the illness. And this associated stigma and discrimination can really exacerbate symptoms and make recovery harder for people going through it. So we have some challenges. And as a society, how are we going to manage these challenges? And what are we going to do when they affect us on a personal level? Fortunately, there is a revolution going on. And that revolution has connection at its heart. Science is showing that having healthy relationships during development actually helps build the foundation of a healthy brain. That feeling accepted, being seen, being loved, being good enough, actually shapes our brains and can save lives. It is increasingly apparent it's not this individual hero struggling to rise above their circumstances through willpower alone or snapping out of it that's needed to conquer addiction and mental illness. Instead, it's this power of community. It's the power of connection. This is what helps us heal, and moreover, this is what helps us build brains that are resilient to life challenges and help us succeed in all measurable life outcomes. So, how are we going to build these connected communities? Well, there's three key ways that I can see. First of all, we can start to invest in physical communities. We can start to build programs that educate, that challenge misconceptions about mental illness, and also start to build the tools and enable young people to be able to help themselves and others. Secondly, we can use the scalable power of technology to start to bring resources and a community of care to those who might not be able to access it in their immediate environment. And thirdly, we can use our individual power. We can start to educate ourselves to see beyond and second question when we see someone with odd behaviors to start to wonder what's going on inside and start to equip ourselves with the tools so that we can help them if they reach out to us. So I want to give you some examples now of organizations that are already doing some of these things to show you how important it is and what more we can do. So connection, huh? We're humans. Most of us know naturally how to connect. It's part of what makes us human. But these are also skills that can be taught. We can teach people how to articulate their internal experiences, manage their emotions, and be there for others when they're doing the same. We can start to demystify mental illness and the brain science behind it, show people that they're more than a diagnosis and that this is not a sentence to a life of pure suffering. We can also start to build what we call executive function skills in children. These are the cognitive toolkits of working memory, stop and think skills, inhibition control, and flexible thinking that predict our success in a range of things across our lifespan, from relationships, career, and health. So there's some organizations that are doing just this in our local environment. One of them is the Dot B Project by the Oxford Mindfulness Center. They work to teach mindfulness in schools, to give kids some of the skills that they can stop and think and take control when something's happening in their life. Another program that I've worked with is Place to Be. 
Place to Be are an amazing organization who provide specialist, highly trained, independent counselors to schools, sometimes in really disadvantaged areas. So some of the kids in these schools come from backgrounds where there's neglect, family breakdown, violence, bullying, and other traumas. And this creates complex behavioral and social and mental health issues. And we know that kids in some of these situations then tend to go on to develop other issues that lead to a downward spiral, and they can end up in our prisons and our hospitals, and we can deal with these problems later on. We can deal with them then or in the next generation. But what Place to Be does is by having this early intervention, by giving independently the parents, the children, and the teachers someone dependable to talk to, by normalizing the process of seeking help and support, by giving kids these place to talk slips where they can ask to have a chat to someone. And they do, the take up is huge. By doing this, they're changing things for this generation. I went to one of their schools last year and was really blown away that there were these little kids running up to me and when I chatted to them, they were really excited to tell me how talking to Angelica had helped them be able to share their feelings with their friends. Now these were seven-year-old boys who were really excited and proud to be telling me they were talking about their feelings. And this is the kind of shift that could make a real change in their difficult young lives. And we see this in the evidence too. So for Place to Be, 74% of parents using the service say it significantly improved their home lives. While 76% of teachers and 88% of children say that it's shifted their behavioral and social and learning issues in the classroom. And this flows on into the rest of their lives. An independent analysis showed that for every one pound spent by Place to Be today, there's an estimated saving of six pounds to society later on, savings in our education or criminal justice systems. And when we have straining mental health budgets and straining budgets in general, these kind of early interventions, these investments in community, are something that's really underutilized. As one final example of what we can do in physical communities, the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative starts to translate some of the brain science I was talking about, about how we can build healthy brains through human connection. They teach this to whole communities, policy makers, families, teachers. And this has been so successful at transforming these communities, giving them emotional resilience, and giving them the tools to embrace people's suffering rather than shutting them away with stigmatization that just exacerbates issues rather than heals. And because of this, now the Alberta government has enshrined this in policy. So they're saying that this is so successful that every human service provider has to be fluent in this brain science, or at least how to translate it into their work to enable human connection in their communities. So what can we do with our online communities? Well, one example comes from an organization that I've been working with and helping to establish with fellow Oxford students. It's called It Gets Brighter, and it's a charity dedicated to sharing messages of hope and support to young people struggling with mental health issues. It's the kind of thing I might have wanted when I was 14, and to show me that I'm not alone, and to show me that there was genuine cause for hope, even if I didn't feel it at the time. We've had video messages come from all over the world, from Egypt, China, Australia, the US, Canada, Lebanon, and many others, as well as indigenous communities. We've had people reaching out to us to thank us for what a difference either sharing their story or watching these video messages has had on their lives. I'm always so blown away by these people showing their strength in their vulnerability. Something else we can do with the increasing ubiquity of mobile phone technologies in vulnerable communities like refugees in low and middle income countries is that we can use this technology to enable us to provide them with mental health resources that they might not otherwise be able to access. So there are people now working to provide ways to monitor people's health and to give them the resources they might need, to educate community aid workers so then when they go into communities, they have the stuff on their phones so that they can help diagnose and help support people and also educate them through these kind of video messages of hope. So I'm really excited about the power of technology to help create these communities around the world. But what can we do, everyone sitting here, everyone watching online as individuals? I know it's gonna sound really cliche now, but you really do never know your power as an individual to be able to connect to someone and change their life. As an example, in 2008, my friend Johnny Benjamin was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. 
At the time, he then felt that his situation was so hopeless. There was so little chance of him having a good life and him being anything other than a burden on society. So he was standing on a bridge in London, ready to jump. His story could well have ended there, but a man walking by, a stranger, did the hard but simple act of stopping to chat to Johnny. He reached out when others might have walked by and he made a connection. He invited Johnny to have a coffee with him. This simple act is what Johnny credits with saving his life. Today, Johnny is an incredible video producer and wonderful human being, and I'm so glad that he's still with us. If we can do all of these things, if we can invest in our physical communities, our online communities, and as work as individuals, we're not only going to create a generation that cares about mental illness, but also revolutionize mental health. The World Health Organization Constitution Preamble states that health is not merely the absence of illness, but rather a state of complete social, mental, and physical well-being. And hence, it's not really merely the absence of illness that promotes and provides mental health. The science is showing that we've invest in teaching and equipping kids with the skills of emotional resilience, of developing their executive function skills. Not only will we build brains that are more resilient to these life challenges, but also do better in all measurable life outcomes. And this is backed up by things like the Harvard Grant Study. Many of you might have heard of it because they looked for 75 years at 268 men. So over all their, their whole life, basically, and measured all aspects of their life to try and understand what made a good, healthy, happy, long life. And what they found, their secret, boiled down to one thing, meaningful human connection. And I also argue that if we equip people to be able to internalize their experiences, manage their emotions, and know that others will be there for them when they do, then we might be able to start to tackle some of the higher rates of male suicide and violence in our communities. As an aside, I'm a DPhil student here in clinical neuroscience, and I look at trying to understand the brain basis for anxiety disorders. So when I argue for this community basis for um, mental health, of educating and inspiring people in this way, I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in more research and better treatments. We definitely should, we definitely need that. But I think that they go hand in hand. It's my hope that as we start to understand the biological basis of mental illness, if we're able to educate and spread that through our communities, we'll start to reduce the stigma in the way we did with cancer. So people used to think of cancer as this moral failing that people might have got it because there was something a bit wrong with their character and that it might be contagious, so you better stay away. Once we understood the biological basis, we started to change this misconception and be able to start to celebrate people who struggled with it for their strength and support them much better. And I hope we can do this with mental illness too. So I think they go hand in hand, but even if we have better treatments, that's not enough. We need to create this community that can care for people going through it. Because if we have a great treatment, but someone comes out of it and doesn't feel like their identity is more than their illness, that they're not accepted by their society, we still will have failed. If we have a great treatment, but we can't get someone to go to it because of the stigma attached, we still will have failed. To do this, we need you. We need you to start to advocate for better programs in our physical communities to teach people and equip them with the skills they need to manage their own and others' mental health. We need you to invest in online communities, spread these messages of hope and support, and work as an individual to educate yourself, to start to question people's behavior, start to look past and try to understand their experiences, to know what to do if someone comes to you with a problem. If you can, try and share your story too. I know it's tricky, all the barriers that existed to talking about my mental illness back then still exist for me today. Concerns over future career prospects or people treating you or thinking of you differently when they find out. But research shows that the best tool we have at the moment to challenge misconceptions and change people's minds is by people being open about their mental illness. So it's hard, but I believe it is worth it. It is weird for me to be standing here, not only because I'm giving a TEDx talk, for crying out loud, but also because talking about my mental illness like this isn't something I ever thought I would do when I was younger. And not only because of this potential embarrassment, 
In fact, now I think we should celebrate people for their strengths, but also because it's not part of my identity anymore and I don't want it to be. I feel like I should be talking about how to save the Great Barrier Reef or the neuroscience of attention. And I think this is what anyone going through any illness wants to in my experience, to be seen as well for all the other things that they are, to know that it's okay to not be okay, that we are enough. The evidence is increasingly clear. It's there in the science and it's there in the success of community-based mental health interventions. What the world needs now is perhaps indeed just a little more love. Thank you.